I've just boarded the flight to New York and it's not very cramped. I think space is going to be quite a luxury on this flight. Also, I'm super snug because I'm wearing the cashmere with the stars to cover the holes from the moths. Worked really well. Bye bye London and hello New York. I've just landed in New York and it's really weird because I'm in JFK, but it's so quiet here. It feels like landing in Limoges. I was not expecting this. Now I'm gonna go and get a yellow cab to Manhattan, to Mason's place, and I've already got changed on the airplane in case we're going out tonight. I'm not in La Land anymore. And we have hit the ground running. I've decided that my drink of the holiday is going to be a dirty martini. This is Stytown, the area where Mason lives, and I wasn't expecting it to be such a wildlife sanctuary. He's gonna come and eat me. There are squirrels everywhere. Okay, now I definitely know I'm in America. We've come out for a ferry ride. I can't believe how gloriously blue sky the weather is. We're making our way to the Wall Street stop so that I can get some decent skyscraper action. And we're going under the three bridges. First, the Williamsburg Bridge, which was opened in 1903. And now the Manhattan Bridge, which was opened in 1912. And finally, the most famous of them all, the Brooklyn Bridge that opened in 1883. And at the time, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world. And there's the New York Stock Exchange, which was built in 1903 in neoclassical style and is now dwarfed by the skyscrapers around it. The charging bull sculpture that's become synonymous with Wall Street is actually one of the world's most famous acts of guerrilla art. The artist who made it, Arturo di Modica, felt indebted to America for his success after he'd arrived in the country penniless in the 1970s. So after the stock market crash of 1987, he spent $360,000 of his own money creating the sculpture and then he trucked it in and placed it outside the stock exchange. It was the 15th of December 1989 and he declared it his Christmas gift to the city, meant to inspire them to fight through the hard times. But the thing that surprised me the most about it is that this entire queue of people are here just to be photographed touching his twin orbs. We found a French patisserie for a snack but I'm most astonished by the thought of garlic croissants. I live in France and I've never seen such a thing. <laughs> okay, I can't leave without getting the garlic croissants. They're going to be for aperitif tonight. We've come to the Convive wine store to see if it's possible to find the perfect wine for garlic croissants. I doubt you've ever been asked this before. Okay, I'm ready. What wine should we have with garlic croissants? I'm sorry, a what? Okay, so sweet and garlicky. This sounds terrible. Yeah, so the wine's gonna save it. The wine will save it. So of the stuff that's here, I would actually point you towards this wine. This is Albert Boxler, mm -hmm. the Elsvicker. So Elsvicker is a blend, and this is primary Sylvaner. So it's like benign and simple, but will also have texture. And then there's a little bit of the virtue and a little bit of Riesling in it. So I have fruits to like mask the garlic, but also like enough acid to keep you like eating the entire croissants. Whoa. <laughs> Boxler, Elsvicker. <laughs> This is the moment of truth. I love the way we're using champagne flutes for this wine because I don't think we can take this seriously enough trying to find the right wine for the croissants. A, does a garlic croissant work in and of itself? It's happening. That is very sweet. Oh, the wine's delicious. I would say the only good thing about that situation is the wine. But I still think, actually, we can make really good garlic croissants in France. Yep, he's shaking his head. We totally could. We totally could. Where have you brought me? What are we doing? I don't even know what it's called. What is it? You tell me. <laughs> a gaming heaven for a geek like me. This is genuinely my idea of heaven. I could stay here playing computer games all night, but I've been cut off. Mason's dragging me away. Apparently we have somewhere else we need to go and I can't play Mario Kart all night. Mason got us surprise tickets for a dinner and show. The perfect way to end a New York day.
Squirrel is a black one, but no time to hang around and play with it because we're going on an adventure. I've arrived at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of my favorite museums in the world, and I'm dragging Mason to see it today. He's never been and he lives in New York, can you believe it? Okay, Mason, are you excited? That's, I think, the most excitement we're gonna get, but hey, he's here, so it's a triumph. I have the tickets, there's no getting out of it now. <gasps> it's happening. He's getting comfortable. I always start my visits to the Metropolitan Museum at the Temple of Dendor. The people of New York are so lucky to have an original ancient Egyptian temple in their city. And the story of how it came to be here is extraordinary. After 2,000 peaceful years on the banks of the Nile, when the Egyptian government built the High Aswan Dam, it was in danger of being submerged forever. Many temples would have been lost forever, but UNESCO stepped in and asked the governments of the world to unite to save the monuments. The American government sent the most money and it helped to save extraordinary temples like Abu Simbel which were moved to entirely new locations and as a symbol of their gratitude the Egyptian government gave the Temple of Dendor to America. The 800 ton temple was disassembled stone by stone. This Sackla wing of the museum was designed to house it. For thousands of years, it stood between the Nile and cliffs and they're represented by the pool of water and the sloping walls. Built in 15 BC on the orders of Augustus Caesar, it was dedicated to Iris and Osiris, as well as the two deified sons of a local Nubian chieftain. I tend to come to the Met not to see the art, but to see the extraordinary examples of interior design that are here. But believe it or not, the inner sanctum of this temple is not the oldest room in this museum, because there is the tomb of Perneb, which is an ancient Egyptian tomb 2,000 years older than this temple. In around 2300 BC, this tomb was built for the palace administrator Perneb. We're standing inside an Egyptian tomb. We're starting in the oldest rooms, but to be fair, these aren't the ones that interest me the most because people didn't live here, they just died here. I think we should get some rooms that people lived in. If any of you are interested in seeing more of Egypt, then I'll put a link here to my vlog of my travels in Egypt with Gerald. Now we're off to a part of the museum that houses period American rooms. This is the Great Hall from the Van Rensselaer Mansion built in New York in 1765. It's quite an important room because it marks the turning point between Dutch fashion and English fashion being most important here in New York. The Van Rensselaers had been here since it was New Amsterdam, but when they built their new mansion in the 18th century, they got all of the decorative elements from England, not from the Netherlands. The magnificent wallpaper was hand-painted in London, and it's one of only three such sets known to remain in existence. But most incredibly, the museum owns the letter that was originally sent with it, which says, I also send a small case marked P, which contains paper for your haul, which cost £38. I wish they may please you. The directions how to place the paper is in the box, and you must take special care if you open it to look at that it be put up as you found it and think it very handsome indeed. Really nothing changes. And if you're wondering who the lady of this manor was, she was Catherine Livingston, the daughter of Philip Livingston, who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. There are just too many splendid examples of American interiors for me to show them all to you now. Oh, there's wallpapers to die for, but I'm on my way to see something very special indeed. This is the most recent addition to the American Wing suite of historic rooms, and it's the dressing room of Arabella Worsham. A dressing room is often a woman's most private space, and if only this room could divulge the private thoughts of the woman who spent 10 years honing her public image within these walls, 
what incredible secrets we would hear. Because surrounded by this intricate satin wood and purple heart marquetry inlaid with mother of pearl, Arabella underwent a metamorphosis from an impoverished woman with a shady past in Richmond, Virginia, to becoming the richest woman in America. Arabella always kept her early years shrouded in mystery, but what is known is that she arrived in New York at the age of 19, apparently the widow of a Mr. Worsham, along with her child. It's unlikely that Mr. Worsham had either been her husband or was dead. That story was probably fabricated to give her a veneer of respectability, as she was actually the mistress of the magnificently rich railroad magnate, Collis P. Huntington. She spent 10 years in the home that this dressing room was in, which was all decorated in the fashionable aesthetic style. And during those years, in this dressing room, she polished her outward appearance of fashionable respectability. She would go on shopping expeditions to the most fashionable shops in London and Paris, and on one came back with over $2 million worth in today's money of clothes and jewels. After that 10-year wait on the death of his wife, Collis married Arabella, and they moved from this home to a huge mansion on Fifth Avenue. Her transformation to respectability was complete, and on his death, she inherited a fortune fortune worth $3.2 billion in today's money. And free to do as she pleased, she went on to marry her husband's nephew. I love to think that that whole rags to riches story occurred in the chrysalis of this dressing room. And what better way to finish a day of beauty and culture than with Japanese food and another dirty martini. Good morning, Mr. Squirrel. He's hiding behind the tree. There are a lot of things being walked on leads today. Dogs, children, pigs. I can't believe we're in the middle of the city. This is so gorgeous. I'm so excited because everyone thought I was mad when I invented the pickle martini at Christmas, the sage and onion one. And I'm in New York having a pickle martini and it's amazing. Cheers. Look at this avocado taste. And now for an afternoon exploring Chinatown and getting a full body massage. I've never seen so many squirrels in a city before. We've come to Grand Central Terminal because we're off to Mason's house in Vermont. We're going towards the cold. Grand Central is a magnificent Beaux-Arts building and is considered a national historic landmark. Covering 48 acres, it has 44 platforms, more than any other station in the world. The famous mural of constellations painted onto the barrel vaulted ceiling of the main concourse has more than two and a half thousand stars. Although there are several astronomical inconsistencies, which were immediately noticed by a commuter back in 1913, they weren't corrected in any of the subsequent renovations of the ceiling. Good to see you wearing your Estonian and jumper. Magnificent. We've made it to Vermont and suddenly we're in a winter wonderland. I'm so happy to see snow. Turns out those mailboxes that we see in American movies really do exist. This is all Mason's driveway and it probably won't surprise any of you to know that he lives alone in the middle of a hundred acre wood. Into the promised land. Oh, is that what you call your home? <laughs> What soup is it, Mason? Dinner time soup. It's dinner time soup. That's all we're getting. So I'm going to guess shiitake mushroom soup. Is there anything nicer at the end of a long day of travel into the snow than a roaring fire and a feast? It's a classic shirt night from Mason. Is that silk? Is there any other material suitable for such a feast? <laughs> no, there isn't. You're quite right. I think not. And it is a beautiful feast. Oh, look at the salad. Though I'm equally excited about the adorable Williams Sonoma plates. Mason. Good. Everything in your house is really weird. Really <laughs> what is the purpose of it? To become a vampire. 
Oh, to become? Or are you one already? Can I join the immortality sect? Alright, I'm just going to nap here then. Oh, hang on. I suspect this is how Mason sleeps. What's this called, Mason? Breakfast. <laughs> it's beautiful. And the view is beautiful too. Well, this is the most exciting part of breakfast. Where is this vodka from? Vermont. Vermont vodka. Yeah, Montpellier. Awesome. Montpellier, oh, eh? near where I grew up in France. <laughs> Mason's taking me cross country skiing so we can go for a picnic, but I've never cross country skied before and I'm a bit worried. I'm a very bad skier generally. Can this possibly be a good idea? What do I do? I've never done this before. What, what do I, how do I even? Yeah, so it's just like riding a bike. <laughs> but you know I can't ride a bike. <laughs> I'm the worst. Where am I going? What am I doing? Allons-y. Where? Wow. On y va. Where, wow, where? Wow. Why aren't you on ski? Why are you just laughing at me? Where am I going even? Just go along the flat. Going along here? Yeah. And we never saw her again. God, it's beautiful. <laughs> Picnic walla. <laughs> My middle name is Sherpa. Well, this is a perfect spot for a picnic. Ooh, what's in the goodie bag? <laughs> okay, I think I need to hold this to show a size comparison. This is a bottle of Hendrix. 1.75, I've never seen one this big, Mason. Oh, you even brought ice cubes in the snow? And fever tree tonic. Thank you very much. You may live in the middle of nowhere, but nice things find their way to your house. And we have Kalamata olive bread with rosemary. It's so delicious. Mm, where to start? There's local brie made in Vermont, truffle cheddar, delicious olives, celery, and hummus. Snow glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footprint to be seen. The kingdom of isolation, and it looks like I'm the queen. <laughs> the wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Let it go, let it go. Sadly, it's time to leave beautiful Vermont. Bye bye, Vermont. It's time to head back. But first, we have an exciting pit stop. We've stopped to get supplies of yummy bread, which is obviously my favorite food, at King Arthur Flour, which incredibly is America's third oldest food and drink company. It was founded in 1790. It originally imported flour from England, but in the 1800s, they started milling their own flour under the brand name King Arthur Flour. Let's go and have a look inside. It's a heaven of kitchen gadgets. My father would have gone crazy in here. I wish I could take these home, but they're quite heavy and I won't be able to carry them. I've only got hand luggage. Okay, I've cracked. I don't know how I'm gonna carry it home in my hand luggage, but with Easter coming, I needed the little bunnies. And of course, I can't leave without getting some goodies to eat. Oh dear, I've bought half the shop. Most excitingly, I'm going to start with a cardamom bun. I love cardamom and I think it's massively underused in baking. Mmm, it's so good. I'm going to start baking everything with cardamom when I get home in bunny shapes. 